I think he half expected her to wander into one of his parties some night, went on Jordan, but she never did. Then he began asking people casually if they knew her, and I was the first one he found. It was that night he sent for me at his dance, and you should have heard the elaborate way he worked up to it. Of course, I immediately suggested a luncheon in New York, and I thought he'd go mad. I don't want to do anything out of the way, he kept saying. I want to see her right next door. When I said you were a particular friend of Tom's, he started to abandon the whole idea. He doesn't know very much about Tom, though he says he's read a Chicago paper for years, just on the chance of catching a glimpse of Daisy's name. It was dark now, and as we dipped under a little bridge, I put my arm around Jordan's golden shoulder and drew her toward me and asked her to dinner. Suddenly I wasn't thinking of Daisy and Gatsby anymore, but of this clean, hard, limited person who dealt in universal skepticism and who leaned back jauntily just within the circle of my arm. A phrase began to beat in my ears with a sort of heady excitement. There are only the pursued, the pursuing, the busy, and the tired. And Daisy ought to have something in her life, murmured Jordan to me. Does she want to see Gatsby? She's not to know about it. Gatsby doesn't want her to know. You're just supposed to invite her to tea. We passed a barrier of dark trees and then the facade of 59th Street, a block of delicate pale light beamed down into the park. Unlike Gatsby and Tom Buchanan, I had no girl whose disembodied face floated along the dark cornices and blinding signs, and so I drew up the girl beside me, tightening my arms. Her wan, scornful mouth smiled, and so I drew her up closer, this time to my face. And that is the end of chapter four.